Hello, welcome to Poetry at the Dali. I'm Hank Hine, the director of the Dali Museum, and it's my honor to welcome you to this series led by St. Petersburg Poet Laureate, Helen Pruitt Wallace. This program is sponsored by the city of St. Petersburg and our members. We have a very special program today, writers who also edit journals. That combination of creation and facilitation is a magical thing, and you will be delighted with what you hear. As is our tradition, we begin the program with a poem by Helen Pruitt Wallace. Helen, thank you for curating this program. Thank you so much, Hank, and thanks to all of you for tuning in for the Dolly Poetry Series. We have a, a wonderful program. Um, for you this evening, and we're so glad you could join us, especially, especially during these dark days. It seems we've had a lot of them over the last couple of years, but um, we're glad to have you with us. Um, tonight, we have terrific poets. We have Philip Freed, who will be um, reading his work and then discussing his journal, um, the, the journal he edits, which is the Manhattan Review, um, a terrific journal. Uh, we also have Danny Lawless, the editor of Plume, and a wonderful poet who will be reading his work and discussing um, that journal and that anthology. And we have Sandra Alcosser, so delighted to have Sandra, um, who is the editor of Poetry International, um, and we'll be reading her wonderful poems too. So um, a lot ahead of us then, after the readings, we'll be talking about um, editing, and you'll um, and I will be learning a lot from these wonderful poets. So um, I will um, read one poem, but uh, apologies, Hank, I am not going to read one of my own poems tonight. I'm going to read a poem by a Ukrainian poet um, by the name of Katerina Kyatko. Um, and I found her work looking online. Um, she's published in a book called Words for War, New Poems from Ukraine. And I was going through the journals of these wonderful poets and ran across um, this particular poem. Um, which has been translated from the Ukrainian by Olina Jennings and Oksana Lutsinyasha. This is called, This Loneliness Could Have a Name. This loneliness could have a name, an Esther or a Miriam. Regiments fall to the ground with an infant's cry. Words hardly fit between water and salt. Under the flag at half-mast, hundreds of hoarse voices laugh, pricked by the splinters of language. This loneliness is vast, bottomless, and so chilling that even a stranger turns away. Restless children wander out of the school, stand by the sea, as if in front of a tribunal. Dried tree branches crackle in the air like transmitters. Somebody keeps calling out the name of the city turned into ashes. This loneliness could be named Sebul or Selima. The names of the abandoned are salty and deep. She comes out, fumbles with the knot of her black headscarf. Her lips are pale. Who is there, she says, do you read me? Does anyone hear us? Just a moment ago, somebody called out our names. Do you read me, son? Try and listen to me. They have all left the shore. Look for them in the sea. Okay, so to start this evening's program, um, I wanted to give you first uh, the bio of Philip Freed, and he's gonna read his poems to kick us off. Philip Freed has published eight books of poems, his most recently Among the Gleesians, which is published by Salmon Poetry, Ireland, 2020. His poems have appeared in numerous journals and over 20 anthologies. Wow. Um, recently, Carol Ruman selected his poem, Yoga for Leaders and Others, 
for her anthology called Smart Devices, Poems for the Guardians, Poems of the Week. In addition to writing poetry, Freed is the founding editor of the Manhattan Review, which started back in 1980. And that of course is an international poetry journal. Please join me in welcoming Philip Freed. So nice to have you with us, Philip. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to read in this series. And I just want to acknowledge the honor of reading with Sandra and Danny, my fellow poets. And I want to express my gratitude to Jesse Lendenny of Salmon Poetry Ireland, who's published my last six books. The first poem I'll read is entitled Voice. Voice is a pretty amazing thing, said the lead researcher for an experiment to implant connective tissue and lining cells from healthy vocal cords into the muzzle of a jammed Kalashnikov reviving the keen patter of one whose speech had unexpectedly faltered. We don't give voice much thought until it goes wrong, he added. It's an exquisite system and hard to replicate. When the transplanted folds of tissue in the AK were triggered, they spoke with the same penetration as a normal forceful voice and therefore could pierce irrelevant objections of walls or of common vehicles metal bodies equally well. And cogent arguments remained intact, even after making contact with bone. Moreover, scientists believe the immune systems of any faltering weaponry will soon accept vocal cords taken from dead human donors. Best of all, high-speed digital imaging revealed the Kalashnikov had endured the scaffolds of tough elastic tissue without failing to cycle and was uttering bursts of words on the tactics and techniques of debate. For example, I commence my case with an attention grabber, or to better rebut my opponent's contention, I remember to cluster subpoints closely together. This next poem is an ethnographic report from a planet it's many light years away from the earth. It's called a planetary pastime. My informant brought me to a stadium crater where fans gather to follow rubble wrestling. Caddy cornered, facing off against each other, two rocks begin to utter mouthless curses, vehement as the planet's molten primordial core while remaining somehow inert. The crowd is transfixed by the stunning bitterness of minerals. Here is a typical clip from the classic bout between FSPAR and QArts, contenders from the continental crust, each an avatar for his mineral nation, the former splendid in his beige spandex, the latter flipping a crystal middle finger. Igneous bastard, I'll send you crying back to your magma. Not before I pound you silly, you high silica crybaby, you flux, you alkali, you sanitary wear filler. I'll decimate your diasterism. The goal of the sport is the utter obliteration of the other. And yet, although the mesmerized fans watch for hours, debate the merits and import of every taunt, depart from the arena at night, but return the next day eager as ever, no one has seen the rocks collide and wrestle. And anyone will confide to you, Sado Voce, that such an event would shake the fabric of space time itself and is unimaginable. Later, I shall have more to say about the passivity ratios in the balance between risk and spectacle among the Glesians. This next poem is a poem not in three stanzas, but in three tweets. <laughs> then the Lord answered Job out of the tweet storm. So what, I did it. Afflicted you in every possible way, just to win a bet. Now you'll understand that the sanctimonious odor of your days, your slaughter of time and pious ritual is nothing to me. What the void at my center craves, and you must agree it's a magnificent abyss, is absolute loyalty. No room on Twitter, sad for the cornerstone of creation, much less the sea with its proud waves, can barely squeeze in the wilderness and the appetite of young lions, one unicorn, a single ostrich egg, or leave room for the glory of the horse's nostrils. Still, my tweet storm shows your pain's lilliputian and cannot contend with mine. 
better get tough and smart before it is too late. We will always have a great relationship with foreign powers like Satan. Domestically, you and I have entered into a private contract, non-disclosure and no complaint. Toss the golden coin of your loyalty into the gnawing void of creation. Any loss of goods and family will be compensated for abundantly. This next poem is a contemporary version of a medieval Scots ballad called Twa Corby's Two Ravens. As I was gazing at the TV screen, I heard two glinting pixels gossip and scheming whispers apart from the venomous debate exploiting fear and anger at our fate. I'm proud to play a minor role in the spectacle, confided one pixel to a brother pixel. Though only a dot, I thrive on populist fervor. There's no doubt rancor brightens, replied his neighbor. Humans invented us and must be our God, said the first, but their omni-impotence is odd. Some kill and some incite to mayhem and riot, but many are happy to watch this passive and quiet, trapped like polar bears on tiny ice floes. They view the calamitainment from their sofas. Now they believe in us, our shifting swarm, whose rapid hypnotic depictions thrill and alarm. Who'd credit that the sinews of a gaze could be picked so clean by flecks that dazzle and daze? I almost feel pity as we teach them further to call a crowd of pixels like crows a murder. The husband, children, dog, and lovely wife lean back. Their lifelike statue is deprived of life, sweetly gathered in apartment spaces, so points of light can gobble up their faces. I was born in 1945 about the same time as the Battle of the Bulge was going on in Germany. I wanted to write a poem, which was kind of a narrative of my birth, and somehow connected with what was going on in the wider world outside. It's called The Battle of the Bulge. Conceived as the world was ripped by cataclysm, I was at first a solipsist, immersed in the amniotic puddle, alerted or lulled by a heartbeat that was jittery or stable, submerged in her and believing we were I, a dog's barking in a lawnmower's drone, the music of sporadic conversation, and the muffled roar of the crowds at a stadium were part of me and all I knew of war. Sounds without sources heard through her rushing blood. A conscripted soul, I was being equipped with a regulation brain, a spinal cord, and millions of synapses for the liberation. I overheard a radio's Marseillaise reverberating through the bones of her body. Later, I caught the authoritative tones of bulletins on the Battle of the Bulge, and though ignorant of military strategy, I mastered the tactics of flutter and kick, but afloat in her, I couldn't like a soldier crawl on my belly. While GIs froze in the forest called Ardennes, half starved, having outrun their lines of supply, I was tethered to mine. Crouching in foxholes or crossing snowy fields into fields of fire, I was snug in her underwater dark. A fetus, I was innocent of the risks of a siege enforced by a German panzer corps and the peril of being deployed in a mother's body or of being born. On December 23rd, the weather cleared, though in her it was still murky, and Allied planes retook the skies. I drifted on, unknowing what was above or below. Then Patton's armor broke their lines, and I would soon assault the breach in a difficult berth new blood and guts to ball at her in the light. This next poem is a soliloquy. I think you'll begin to realize who speaks it. Murder most foul. Saw the air and mouth my lines like a town crier, not I. However, I'd like to fiddle with what literati call a soliloquy derived from late Latin solioquum, a talking to oneself, though it's peculiar to speak aloud alone in my own head. My early death in the play afforded me leisure to rescan the rest and convinced me I could cast myself in nearly every part. For instance, 
knowing my son Laertes to a T, I can portray his unbalanced youthful humors and his bent in scolding his sister to mimic his elders. And I'll do a salubrious Horatio, good fellow who gets to survive the entire play. He's the very model of a friendly witness, or is it a witnessing friend? Anyway, I who have witnessed my whole life in his friendly unfolding will be ideal for this role. I'd even essay Ophelia using a father's insight to heighten the poignancy of her position vis-a-vis -vis the prince. After all, it's men who play women in theater. And my Polonius will display tact and compassion in allowing himself to be led by the mad prince in pronouncing a cloud so readily to be a whale or a camel. Polonius, whom the prince regards as a chamber pot of slosh with adages, an aris lurker or bag of guts to be lugged, is a courtier loyal and true to Claudius, whose kingly manner I've narrowly observed as a basis for a persuasive impersonation. And as for Hamlet, I'll out Hamlet him, but squint wise, so the nobles get a whiff of his intellectual pretension and self-pity. I'll offer my own head as a model for the skull of Yorick, eloquent though quipless and grave. Relieved of the irksome tick of self-laceration, my soliloquy is going so well, I'm emboldened to advise and coach the author who clad in the dead king's armor haunts his own drama and stalking the stage for revenge growls, murder most foul. And the last poem I'll read is another Shakespearean riff. It's called The Chevril Glove. And the epigraph says Shakespeare's father was a glove maker. Some in the audience saved from the shipwreck of daily life ask their neighbors, what country friends is this? And hear the reply, Illyria, which is a nation fabricated entirely of words, where emotions flow in meter, but where gender, men masquerading as women playing men, is high fantastical. Their national diet with musicians attending is music, food of love, their currencies an exchange of fungible size, and their refugees a single pair of twins. Then the maker who washed us safely ashore in this clement country sees us out again with a hey-ho back into the wind and the rain. How quickly a good wit can manipulate a chevril glove, soft and pliable, turning the wrong side outward. So as Malvolio, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you, cross-guarded in tights, vanishes into the offstage oblivion, leaving only the yellow stain of his humiliation and no small gain to ourselves, mockery stockholders. The maker will soon be concocting an honest Iago, who through soliloquies and asides will render us tragedy's complicit witnesses. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Those were terrific. Uh, Thank you. Philip, Thank you. so many worlds. You've created so many worlds in that 10 minute reading. <laughs> Um, really terrific. And I look forward to having all of us chat about them um, during our, our Q&A. So um, I want to learn how you do that. <laughs> um, okay, now, uh, thank you again for that, for that good reading. Uh, next, we have Sandra um, Alcosser. So happy to have you with us, Sandra. Um, Sandra Alcosser is a fish to feed all hunger and accept by nature received highest honors from the National Poetry Series, the Academy of American Poets, and AWP Award Series. She's received three National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships and served as Montana's first Poet Laureate. She directs SDSU's MFA each fall and is the editor of Poetry International. Her, her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Paris Review, Poetry, and Pushcart Prize Anthology. Um, welcome, Sandra, so glad to have you with us. Thank you, Helen, and um, thank you, Philip, for a, a stunning line, um, your pain is Lilliputian. I, <laughs> I, 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 um, I think I'll probably use that this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I thought about uh, what I would read today. And the, the fact that when Helen got in touch with me, 
she said that we would be talking about our editorial work. And so I decided to theme my reading around collaboration because it's what we're doing as, um, as editors and on the other side, very much so as poets. And so I'll start with the easiest one. Um, Prairie Schooner invited me to uh, give them uh, a poem on clothing for a special issue that they were doing. And so it's always that moving, moving around in the dark. Um, I, I sent them a poem on, um, I sent them on a packet, of, uh, a packet uh, on old clothes, wedding dress, men marching naked on the beach. Um, and the one that they picked was the one that had the tiniest bit of cloth in it. And this is, this is it was a surprise to me. Uh, it's called Mother Ease. When the skinny girl streaks by, I long to be her, maybe 13, a blue carousel tattooed around her left thigh, just below her cutoff jeans. Not a younger version of me. This one sliding fearlessly down the slope on a skateboard. Follow me, she yells at the hidden side of a tree. To another girl, I cannot see the shy one who would have been me, and I become the mother of a brave daughter who glides with utter joy occupying an entire college campus late July. A rhythm to her giant glasses, ponytail, and legs, negotiating each crack in the pavement. We weave in and out of shade, 90 degrees, my mind racing ahead of her life. Her wrist, a form of disobedience, a necessary chemistry, a deviation from the norm, delicious. Her risk almost fully, nothing gambled but her body. Her voice still sings to me. As I enter the pine paneled library, exact same beat, exaggerated speech melody of mother ease, baby talk. Well, you'll be all right, she croons to the girl left behind. None of us can completely escape our female hormones, our DNA. We care for each other this way, in cadence, in layers. Are you sure you'll be okay? Nice. This is a slightly different one. This was a um, musical collaboration. The uh, wonderful husband string quartet invited me to um, work with the composer Garrett Schatzer and um, uh, incredible soprano. Uh, you can find her online and Moss. Um, so the the composer asked me to write a lament. And I had to go back and really study them closely because I'm, I'm not a person given naturally to lamentation. And so I wrote a dragon's lament and a robin's lament. And the only thing, finally I did this, the, 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 the lover's lament. Um, and he, the one constraint I had was that, um, he told me that the vowels had to be open. It had to be a vowel, so just uh, at the at end of each line, so the singer could open her mouth and keep it open and, and sustain it for as long as she would like. You lift me into sleep. A teaspoon of powder, a teaspoon of honey, a little yellow meal, an egg, a cup of sweet milk, and I can carry corn cake and a glass of tea for each of us. And you will promise to take care of me forever. What good is lullaby if we all vanish, don't we? What good is cake and steep tea? But when I cannot sleep, you fold an arch into the crease of your palm, and whirls of flesh that have touched gloss, brushed and shimmered for its surfaces, will run along the nerve that digs into my heart. And I'm falling as a bee falls, too heavy with pollen, as a foot falls, gives up its journeys to nest in the heat of another's body, a lifetime to make a gram of honey. 
So this is what I wrote for Garrett, the composer, but I gave him a packet just to look through in case he wanted to pull some others. And there's always surprise. And so this is one of the poems he picked. It's called uh, God the Condor. I pull the God of Thunder. I pull him from a nest. I pull a little nestling glimp, hold him to my chest. From his stomach take half a cup of plastic, half a cup of glass, and from his crop lift four bottle caps. What will make us well again? What will make us sing? Poisoned by ideas, poisoned by machines. God is cleaning up. Now God is eating. Inside a calm pink face, lead bullet casings, a black bow of frames, his shoulders like a painting. Imagine no more soaring, no more Pleistocene, no more clouds pulled together by his wings. God's coming for us now. He looks a little queasy. He rubs his head against the rock. He sharpens his teeth. And I'll tell you, I just didn't all come together until we did the world premiere of, of Lament. And um, to hear Anne Moss sing that was an extraordinary event. For actually, I, I know it was for me, but everyone said it just gave them all chills. Mm -hmm. But this was another one that he, came, he um, used in the Lament. So he starts out quite gently with this one, Murray for Boris. Coming home, late spring night, stars of foreign language above me. I thought I would know the moons like the family, their dark flames. Sea of crisis, sea of nectar, soup and sea. How quickly a century passes, minerals crystallize at different speeds. Limestone dissolves, rivers sneak through its absence. This morning, I learned painted turtles sleeping inches below the stream bank freeze and do not die. 15 degrees, moray for Bora, sea of cold, second quadrant of the moon's face. I slide toward the cabin, arms full of brown bags, one light syrups over strips of snow. Night rubs icy skin against me. And I warm small delicates, cilantro, primrose, close to my body. A hundred million impulses race 300 miles an hour through 17 square feet of skin and gravity that collapses stars, lifts Earth's watery dress from her body, holds me with such tenderness I hardly breathe. And now, um, I, I decided that I'd like to uh, do, share a collaboration that originated uh, right, well, I'm in California, but originated on your coast in, in Florida at the Hermitage at uh, Manasota Key. And if I can pull this up, uh, basically, I'll just give the basic, uh, background, uh, we were asked to, uh, well, they asked us if we wanted to collaborate uh, for a performance in Symphony Space in New York. And uh, the theme of it was 1963, the end of Camelot. And uh, the, the assassination of, of um, uh, John Joe Kennedy. And it was so interesting because when I started thinking about what I wanted to, to write, most of the voices at that time were strongly men's voices. Most of the leaders were men. And I couldn't find a voice that fit well until I thought about one of my heroes, and that was Rachel Carson who um, basically uh, brought Silent Spring to the fore. 
uh, at that particular time. And she was actually dying of cancer when all of, all of this came forward. So I, I worked with Michael. Michael is a painter, a gorgeous painter in, in New York City. And this is what we came up with for our performance. Nineteen sixty three, and the earth said, A little less poison, please. With rustling sounds through fallen leaves, the sparrows flitting under stores said, Yes, please, less for me. The ant hoisting his brother's body in the nest said, Yes, and sharks feeding in the sea, and fish eagles building cribs of mops and lawn chairs, yes, and vultures who couldn't stop eating, could not stop eating. A little less 2,4-D, less DDT and BHC, a little less in our well, a little less in our bloodstream, from the nerves of earthworms to the ovaries of thrush and their exquisite melodies, for everything eating and eaten, a little less Poison, please. Rachel Carson's silent spring and her testimony to Congress in 1963 legislated our kinship with all forms of life. The oldest creatures in the world make love. At first I thought they were the buff leaves of the sea grape floating toward me as I stood in a keyhole cut through mangrove and tried to walk into the cool bay. Jingle shells cut me, and then the wake carried them forward, each breathing like a face, and I knew these were not leaves but creatures, rays perhaps, and they came so close I stepped away and studied a bubbling as lost in reverie. They crawled toward my naked feet. They rose like marbled endpapers in the brain, these ancient shapes that illuminated our grade school manuscripts, each shell with ten eyes soaking its coppery body in moonlight. What did she feel, I wondered, as he held on to her so gently from behind? Was she designed for pleasure? Was he what part of her flowered as they floated like buoys, bobbing together? I knew how a god might feel standing above them, milky froth trailing their hems. Weren't these the oldest beings in the world? What is this texture of seeing if there is not a god? What is this capture we feel from above and within? Mossy green bay with little more than slapping mullet where one might live unmolested, unseen, where I watch two horseshoe crabs, tender coupling, as I hoped once a god watched me. Sandra, thank you so much um, for that wonderful reading. Um, I love all the sounds of your words. I'm hearing a lot of um, rhyme, a lot of internal rhyme, not seeing them on the page. I'm not quite sure if they're technically forms or not, but I look forward to um, maybe all of us discussing that in, in our Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in the video also will be so wonderful to be able to see. So uh, thank you um, for that terrific reading and, and performance. So <laughs> lastly, we have um, Danny Lawless. Um, many of you have seen Danny on our program before and we're so happy that he was able um, to join us again for this reading and then also the discussion about editing, um, which will happen in a few minutes. So Danny, welcome um, back to the Dali. Um, Danny Lawless's book, The Gun My Sister Killed Herself With, was published in 2018. Recent and forthcoming poems are in Field, Barrow Street, Prairie Schooner, Plowshares, Poetry International, Los Angeles Review, Upstreet, and Massachusetts Review, among many other journals and reviews. Danny's a recipient of a continuing Shifting Foundation grant. He's the editor and uh, founder of Plume, a journal of contemporary poetry um, and also Plume Editions and the, the annual Plume Poetry Anthologies. And that's what he'll be chatting um, with us about in a few minutes with respect to editing. Um, but it is such a pleasure to have you 
back with us, Danny. And um, I can't believe how busy you've been in addition to, because I know what's involved and what you're doing with Plume. So um, congratulations on all those publications, even in the middle of all that. So welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, two difficult acts to follow. Those are really wonderful poems. Uh, I'm going to read just a couple of short poems. Uh, it's been a rough couple of years for everyone. Uh, and I've lost a couple of friends, which I will address in a couple of other short poems. And uh, really my entire family, one after another, uh, in the last five years. So I'll speak to that. But then I hope to uh, end on a happier note. I happened to uh, Chris Buckley out in Santa Barbara. We were going to do a, a workshop on editing. And I wrote a poem for it, but it never quite uh, the... Uh, I don't know, some technical difficulties that, that didn't come off, but it's even appropriate things. So I'll end up with a poem about editing. Great. Uh, so, okay, the first one is called, uh, it's from a series that will be in the next book. It's, uh, the series is called Definitions, self-explanatory. Um, the first one's called uh, Freudenschreck. Freudenschreck or intense pleasure fright. Leave it to the Germans to coin a word for the fleeting sense of being seized by such an inexplicable joy it verges on terror. Or maybe it's inexplicable joy. Maybe it's, can I start again? I'm so sorry. Can I start again? Yes, sorry. yes, no problem. <laughs> John can splice you, no problem. Go ahead. Okay, Freudenschreck or intense pleasure fright. Leave it to the Germans to coin a word for the fleeting sense of being seized by such an inexplicable joy it verges on terror. Or maybe it's inexplicable terror pretending to be joy. Also a physical phenomenon. Neurologists say the amygdala Glows red as a jackball, whether subjects gaze at images of plantesimals or gallows. Picture a joy ride, the Appalachian pin brides of Eugene Meatyard. Put yourself in the shoes of Ayana Clemens, 44, of Peru, Indiana, a longtime congregant of the End Days Christian Church, according to the Gazette who may have had a seizure that caused her to shiver all over. Although another passerby reported hearing her shout, praise him or praise God, before she sort of rocked him, before casting that beautiful child into that cold river. Uh, the next one is called Aglet, uh, the second of the definition poems. Uh, perhaps you recall what the term means, I didn't until I had to fish around in my memory. Aglet, a bloodletting tool, a vestigial claw, a liturgical vestment, a kind of stitch or stenographical notation, a vase, a fresh born eel. It's fun now to imagine it could be any of these, but in 1967, the right answer was, the little sheath at the end of a shoelace. Da's nightly vocabulary quiz home from the Clifton Cab Yard, the summer before Sean and I would try for posh St. Tim's. Years ago now, but I can still see it. His pressed shirt and flocked cap, that pipe he crowed the mayor himself had given him. The two of us watching a drop of spittle trickle the length of its lacquered stem as he continued from the old French, agui needle, to point or pierce, colloquially a small sorrow. Hmm. Those are the definition poems. Um, this is a poem that I think uh, I should thank my friend, friend Richie. She published a number of these things in Upstreet. This one's called Etch Pewter Bird. And it's rare that one has the object of one's poem at hand but it happens to sit at my desk. And this is the etch pewter bird of the title. Raise your hand up a little. Oh, you can see he opens too. There you go. Yeah. Can you, yeah. Can you see him? 
I could try one more time, a little higher. There you go. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's it. That was the genesis of this poem called Etch Pewter Bird uh, about a loss, unfortunately. Etch Pewter Bird, you who are empty and so neither desire the expensive organic seed mix or require the attentions of the fastidious vet, who do not cheap so psychotically cheerfully that sometimes I want to throttle you. <laughs> You who do not retreat coyly from my outstretched hand or tremble wildly if I hold you. Who never once perch spitefully in the branches of the thorny locust tree behind the garage after I left your cage ajar in summer. Or in other seasons mockingly eluded my ridiculous broom. You who fix your everantine eye indifferently upon me at all times, unlike real birds who think regard me at all, regard me suspiciously or skeptically and keep their distance as if they were tourists guarding their passports. You, in other words, little generic etched pewter bird on my desk who should signify nothing at all to me, in fact except from the cost of the country, the news arrived not, 80 hours, not eight hours ago yet, this windless December night, that my oldest friend in this world is dead. And there isn't anything she or I can do about that. And my heart, oh, my stunned heart, on its cupola of ribs now is cold now, as your weather vane double, nameless, hollow, not hawk or a sparrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll do um, a happier one and then the editorial one and we'll be done. Uh, this one's called Boyhood. Oh no, there's a, there's a terribly sad one. I should definitely read the terribly sad one, right? Ah, here it is. Here it is. Um, my brother and my sister both uh, succumbed to schizophrenia at age 15. And um, this is, a, we have a lot of family photographs. And this was about my brother who um, was just about that age. And I can see in his eyes, somehow I think, that he knew what was happening and what was to be. It's called Family Photographs, Solar Eclipse, 1965. How happy you were to be 11 and unconcerned for once with schools, the cubs, who hated who. For a few minutes to be unlearned, to be taught a new world. Oh, distant boy, how marvelous it all must have been to be turned into a ghoul with your friends, to spurn the murmur of grown-ups with their highballs and hair on the deck for a lowering sky burned sepia orange. At three o'clock to feel yourself disappear inside yourself, to cast no shadow. And so long ago now, how did you put it? The delicious, insistent thought, what if it stays like this? To yearn and yet to not to know yet what that yearning meant. And the uh, Editorial poem is an odd thing. Uh, we all, as editors, although given the number of submissions we have, we don't get to write as back in the dark ages sometimes editors did to us, real notes, real letters. Uh, often we click yes or no on submittable and say thank you or no thank you. Um, but Chris Buckley and I had this idea that we try this, and uh, this was sort of the letter that uh, the submissions were actually real, kind of unfortunately. Um, but um, it's based on the, the kind of thing I would have liked to have said to this poet. And the title is Emails to a Young Poet, with a reference to Wilco, of course, uh, Letters to a Young Poet. And so this one's to Frank, actually. This one to Frank, my barmaid at Applebee's. As at 35,000 feet, I still see and hear myself shouting, say hello to Doris, 
toward the receiving Stetson in the full flush of four Dos Equis as we head for our separate gates after our little bro tango of Trump and Big 12 football that somehow clacked its floor, four floor shimes right off the dance floor into the starry dynamo of the machinery of night. Or was it Dora? Anyway, although somehow I don't envision you as the type to be caught cowering in your in unshaven rooms in your underwear or burning cigarette holes in your arms, protesting the narcotic tobacco haze of capitalism, I could be wrong. A great poet, if not an angel headed hipster, might be slouching under that Lux salesman getup. Okay, maybe not a great poet, though not terrible either. Like most of us, you have your moments. I'm thinking the best one about the otters, their steady gaze upon me like the blank pages of old calendars. I'm not sure what it means, but I sense something wise here, something zazen that doesn't do time or regret. Or maybe I'm jealous. The otters I've met mostly have taken a look at me and skedaddled. The little pouches under their arms where they keep spare rocks to hammer open sea urchin shells, you say? I didn't know that. It reminds me suddenly of my uncle, uncle Alejandro, whom I adored, a hairy little man with big enemies who carried a derringer in his pocket through the dim alley, alleys of Cicero, Illinois. And who would have thought Romp or Raft was their group name? That some, contra the sea urchins, are actually ovo vegetarians. Do you know the word sapiosexual? It means a person who finds intelligent to be the most attractive feature in, the, in a human being. Noble, but in the end doomed. The first girl I kissed on the lips was a budding 15 year old Egyptologist. Her thin tongue slithered in my mouth like a dry hieroglyph for a few seconds and that was that. Into her cousin, lie the big-breasted Ophelia. What I mean is these artifacts are good things to know, but not the lingering scent of Jeanette on your neck, not one ragged, unpainted toenail. They lack privacy and magic. What else? The word empire, not to nitpick. But while I can imagine myself as an otter on the shore bowing to an otter king, waving his paw when he flew by on his back, I'm not sure his fur regalia would be different from mine. Would he sport epaulets and a crown of some kind like a cartoon? Or do you mean in the Orwellian sense, all otters are kings, but some are kinglier than others, smarter or fatter, their coats glossier, perhaps. Explore? And wouldn't he be on top of, not inside, the royal carriage of the river? Then things really go haywire. In stanza three, the black fluidity of space, the amphorae of the frontal lobes, sounds to me like Heraclitus and Arthur C. Clarke have been standing a little too close in the poetry elevator. And how does this relate to consciousness exactly? By the time a few lines later we get to the giant, your father, in his shirt front, confetti with scattered palm mall flakes. You've lost me. The otter has lost, left the building. So Frank, imagine me putting on my editor's hat. Unfortunately, like the others, loneliness with otters is not for us. And now putting it back on again. Maybe it's not for anybody. What I mean is how to say it. I'm no horticulturist, but a few days ago, I was leafing through one of my wife's international field guides and came across an orchid called the Rysenthia gardenia. Dime-sized, apparently it lives its entire life unseen, compressed in underground crevices in Western Australia, where over generations, its scent develops wild, unheard of intensities many multiples of the common rose. Does that help? Or what's the line? The bird, the painter doesn't paint that makes the whole sky bluer. Something like that. On a personal note, decades ago, I did a good thing, a small thing, 
involving black ice and a station wagon full of teenagers, but told no one. Just the thought of it all these years is like a nightlight in the back of my brain, illuminating some pretty dark stairs, a lot of gray, solemn afternoons. Anyway, sorry, gotta run, buddy. I can see the lights of Newark from my window seats, Christmas ornaments smashed to smithereens. Gotta unplug, gather up all these goddamn cords, stuff in my computer case, and text my brother-in-law. By now, I guess you're halfway to that convention in Dallas. Maybe you're thinking about Dolores or Dora, scarfing peanuts, maybe starting to write another poem inspired by the curlicued blue ribbon on the woman's head crowning over the seat in front of you, the way it bobs like an amberjank blur, and then the steady stream of cold air rushing from the little nozzle. I can see that. But Frank, don't. Leave that woman's head alone. Just this once for me, permit that ribbon to unfurl unmolested with all the majesty it can muster, which is a lot. Remember what I said about the flower, the bird, and the good thing. The power of compound pound interest is astonishing in the inner life, too. What did Wilde say? Only secrecy makes modern life mysterious or marvelous. Yours, Daniel. <laughs> that was terrific, Danny. Thank you. Um, what, a, what a range of emotion. To go from mm. your, you know, such sad poems than to end to end with that one. Um, mm. And I guess we'd all be so lucky to have an editor who would spend so much time on our poems, <laughs> whether the work was accepted or not. You know? <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed that. And it's a perfect poem to end on um, as we segue into this next part of our of our evening, um, which is to hear from you all about um, the journals that you publish. Um, about the maybe the processes that poems go through, um, the process of your decision making as you decide what to include. Um, I have several questions, but maybe first, if you don't mind, um, if you could just tell us a little bit briefly about your journals, and um, I'd love to um, hear first um, from you, Sandra, and then we'll um, go to Philip and then Danny. So, Sandra. I think he, yeah. Poetry International uh, is uh, in the process of celebrating its 25th anniversary. It's amazing. And um, <laughs> I, uh, the uh, first editor uh, was uh, the late Fred Moore Monaco. And he, I'm guessing, probably was the editor for 12 years and then Ilya Kaminsky for 12 years. And um, now I, I'm editing it. And um, one of the great things is having had Ilya as the editor of Poetry International for 12 years, set a format that we are that we hope to follow in, in, in many ways. Um, that, if you go look back through earlier Poetry Internationals, um, the, there were many invitational portfolios. And then they had a few people come. Well, there, were, there was open submissions too. Actually, he claims there were never open submissions, but, but Somehow, we are, we inherited a huge backlog of poems. So, um, but the other model that I'm following uh, is a, a journal that I am quite fond of, and that's Ted Weiss's um, quarterly review of literature that was published by Princeton and is really hard to find now. Uh, oddly enough, the University of Montana actually has the back issues and, and um, its portfolio is probably four portfolio, usually four portfolio location. And it would be the likes of Jane Hirschfield, 
um, she published, that was her first book, uh, published beside Wislawitz and Borska. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we're going to do, uh, because our, our ability to publish, our cash flow depends in large part on the endowment and then on the competitions. Um, and so we'll, this issue will be, Ilya's, Ilya and I, did, our last issue was 700 pages. This one is going, I, I have winnowed it down to five, a mere 500 pages. Wow. And um, going forward, my managing editor, uh, Paula Stacy, is looking toward 100 to 200 okay. pages. So, uh, but what wow. would, uh, what we are featuring in um, our portfolios and uh, most of those in translation. Although the anniversary issue that's coming out, I'm quite excited about, um, it has a, a section of, of essays from the last, the best essays from the last 25 years uh, edited by Jenny Minetti Shippey, a huge prose poem section that has Michaud in it, of course, uh, 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 Danny, um, and um, then a series of portfolios that I took um, from um, Iceland and El Salvador and Spain and so forth. And then uh, a, an offering of poems from the last 25 years. And it is going to open with um, this was a surprising thing because all of the portfolios are translations, but I happened to be in touch with Kevin Kluffer, who sent me a portfolio that works so well that I'm actually going to open with his portfolio. Okay. So, and it's, it's, it's a good one. I, Danny and I have been in, in uh, communication before because I, I so love the portfolio that he did of... Uh, Kevin's and it was purely by accident that he happened to submit this to me. So. Mm, wow. And when does that come out? Um, the spring. In the spring. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. And the other challenge, and I maybe you all can speak to this, um, were also uh, I, I wanted to do an online quarterly, but um, again, the managing editor who is the, the, the one who has the most experience, I have editorial experience, but I, being a managing editor is a whole other um, um, expertise. And um, so she wants to just remove our deadlines for the online and just run things as they're ready. So I know I just, I just sent you that, um, well, well, the, the voices of, the, of, the, of Ukraine. Uh, that, that we put out as, as a folio this last year. Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful, yeah. It's so important right now, yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you, um, Sandra, for telling us uh, about Poetry International and we'll come back with some more, some more questions. But Philip, would you tell us a little bit about the Manhattan Review, please? Sure. First, I wanna say how impressed I am by Poetry International and Plume. They're really excellent magazines. Mm -hmm. I started the Manhattan Review in 1980 when I had just got out of grad school. And I was looking for a way of connecting with the larger world. And uh, my first issue was people I knew and people in New York and even myself. It was the first and last time I published my own work. I decided that was not the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things I like best about the magazine is the acquisition sort of the thrill of the hunt, finding new things and being surprised. I got very interested in Polish poetry. Someone from Chicago, Frank Kujawinski, sent me poems of Stanisław Baranczak, and I loved them. I started to get more interested in Polish poetry, and I did an issue on Zbigniew Herbert in 1984. Wow. And so the magazines are connected to each other by this sense of being continually surprised and finding new things and trying to put American poets in the context of international poetry, which Poetry International and Plume do so well. 
And um, I like to have the two, two types of poets, the American poets and the international poets side by side. In the last 10 years, I've been doing a lot of poets from England, not as special features, but as sort of continuing following the same voices. I have English voices and American voices side by side, Philip Gross, George Shirtish, with Dean Nerxa and Marilyn Hacker and keeping that strand going. And the magazine has become an annual because that's about all I can manage. Mm -hmm. So they're getting larger and larger. <laughs> it's becoming almost like a semi uh, kind of an anthology as well as a magazine. Mm -hmm. Remember Ted Solitorov used to do a fiction magazine that was also sort of like an anthology as mm -hmm. well. So that's a quick summary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, um, so yeah, I'm struck by, I mean, the length of the length of those. I can see how resorting to an, an annual would be um, would make it a, a little easier to do because you don't want to sacrifice quality. And um, um, that's that's when will you when will you have your next? Um, will your next one be an annual then? Yeah. So they come out in November. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Terrific. Good. Good. Um, Danny, would you tell us a little bit about Plume? Because of course you are continuing um, to, you do your annual, you do your anthologies, but you also have the journals and um, it's, it is a lot, I know. So would you tell us a little bit about, about Plume, which is it such can, a- It can be a lot. Um, it certainly was in the early days when I began, I really was just myself doing, I just, I was doing it, trying to do it all. Uh, but we started, there were 25 years of Poetry International uh, with um, Philip, so you were in 1980, Philip? Yes. Wow, and Sandra, when did Poetry International begin? 25 years ago. <laughs> Wow. So I'm the new kid on the block. <laughs> you we are. Just, <laughs> we were just uh, going into our 10th year, or 11th year, actually. And I it's also did it, I, I think I probably did it in reverse. We began as strictly an online journal uh, 10 years ago. And the format was important for me then. Uh, we published 12 poems a month. And um, then sometimes they're brief portfolios where it's kind of a name only, there are 12 poems, there are 12 contributors, but maybe someone will have five poems or two, three poems. Uh, and then we had a book reviews and then an essay and um, some other things. So it's kind of a, gotten longer as we've gone on. Uh, and then it quickly dawned on me that there were a couple of, 10 years, even 10 years ago, there were people and re, there remain a number, not a, not a lot, but some poets who simply will not publish online and prefer, will publish only in print. I'm thinking of three as I speak. And they're wonderful, uh, but I thought maybe this is not so good uh, an idea. So we, then we started the anthology, the print anthology uh, in year one. And it turned out to be symbiotic. I would um, write to people just out of the blue saying, look, I'm doing this anthology. And I'd ask for two poems from them, uh, one of which I would publish in the print anthology and once one I would hoard and keep for the um, online editions of Bloom. And um, that lasted for, those lean years lasted for a few, probably five years, and then eventually I got some a layout person, and now the staff is just wonderful. I mean, I feel like I have less and less. It looks like a lot that I'm doing, but really not so much. I mean, they take care of a lot of it and um, even help read the submittable. Oh, God, it's so cringy. You know, look at submittable and there's 500 poems you have to read. And, uh, but I have to do less now because I have a wonderful, wonderful staff. Uh, and I got a continuing grant that uh, pays for all this. So I, I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. yep. And I've learned, I've been, I've been able to learn from Philip and from Sandra and from some others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they are all three such wonderful um, journals. And all of you, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I know, of course, Poetry International um, and also Manhattan Review, but but Danny, you also publish International Poets. Yes. Um, and so if you don't mind, if you would each talk a little bit about that, I'm curious because um, I'm, I'm wondering if you found your own writing, your own writing styles, um, how that may have um, changed over time as you have become increasingly aware of editing your, the international poets who make their way into your journals. Um, do, are, you, are you noticing any shifts even in your own writing style as a result of the influences that you explore um, through their submissions? Anyone can start. I feel much more a part of that world than I, I did before. And it, the one place that I notice um, a difference is when I'm, well, for instance, this semester I'm teaching the, uh, the graduate manuscript workshop. And so I'm looking at um, primarily right now, although it changes, we, are, we often have international poets um, in, in the workshop, but right now, um, for the most part, they're, um, they're American or Latinx, meaning they're, they're going, because we're, we're a border university. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting to, to see their poetics that come in waves <laughs> change. Um, and to compare them to, say, um, Eastern European poets, for instance, which is another, it's a, I follow uh, Philip's uh, read on that. I'm a, a big fan of, of a number of, of Lithuanian, um, Polish, uh, Ukrainian, and so forth uh, uh, poets. Um, so as far as influencing my own work, um, I was fortunate to have Ilya teaching um, beside me for, 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 for 12 years. We taught together, but when the classes would finish, we would have these really animated, heated discussions till three o'clock in the morning about, about poetry. The, the one thing he would always say, oh, Yes, but is he a great poet? <laughs> you know, and, so, <laughs> um, and so I think that that helped um, also grow that uh, poetic. Um, so yes, it's had an influence on, on my work. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting to, you know, it's like having multiple personality disorder, <laughs> just travel these various worlds and yeah. to be influenced by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Philip, how about you? I find that I was very influenced by Polish poetry, sensing the power of public poetry. People like Herbert have encouraged me to, to write in that manner, or at least the, the strength of the public poetry. So that, that was the definite influence. Can you also, tell a little bit more about that? Um, give us an example or when you were, how would you say it's made you uh, want to write a little bit more of the public poem? That's an interesting I admire I admired their, their wit, the employment of wit in public poems, like Baranchek. I had a poem about the, this, these words, these very same words mm. could be used for, for this and for that. Mm. He strung it together in such a witty fashion, but also very, a witty poem can also be very impassioned mm -hmm. to see that combination of things, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. encouraging. Yeah. And so I think I, I try to do something similar in my own work. And then I would enjoy Shirtish, the British poet. He came from Hungary during 56. Mm -hmm. Someone with an Eastern European sensibility and wit, but who was very involved in poetic form, mm. very conscious of form. So I like that combination of wit, form, and impassioned public statement. Mm -hmm. That combination appealed very much to me. Mm. I was learning from the poets that I was selecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think I heard some of that in your poems. 
um, as well as multiple layers of diction, um, you know, that seem to come through, which I, I like the play of your, of your diction, you know, with, um, uh, I'm thinking of your, your multiple worlds, your the kind of a sci-fi sort of thing and, and you know, the extraterrestrial uh, diction that, that makes its way into your poems that are still big ideas and lofty and, you know, so anyway, I think I, I hear a little bit of what you're talking about um, in your own poems. So, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Danny, how about you? Um, I, again, I went at this backwards, I'm sure. Uh, when I was 16 or 17, I would haunt the Louisville Free Public Library. And that the newspaper there is run by the Binghams, who were great liberal contributors to the arts and endowed a great French section of the library. And I tumbled upon all sorts of French authors, but uh, also Benedict's books, uh, the International Anthology, the Prose Poem, and uh, mm -hmm. the Anthology of Surrealism, which just knocked my socks off at 17. I thought, what? This is just <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, kind of, you know, how you do, you follow the breadcrumbs and I uh, went to Jerry and Arto, but uh, eventually I found also uh, Falin, who I think should be read yes, yes, much yes, more than yes, he yes, is, absolutely. he's just a master. Uh, he is the, in some ways the French cynic, I don't know, I, there's that element always of the uncanny in his work. Uh, and Merwin, of course, to just the best translations I've ever read of Transparency of the World of Philan. Mm -hmm. But so I started backwards. I went international first. And I don't think for 20, I didn't, you know, I didn't write for 30 years at all. I was reading. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And I read almost exclusively uh, European, South American, African poetry, Japanese poetry, and didn't really. So great, great gaps in my reading of American poets until, not remedied until maybe 15 years ago, I found some people. But um, yeah, the, the, I know what you mean, Phil, about that sort of wittiness. And there's a certain cold eyed look at the world, uh, not cynical, but certainly realist. Um, in the Eastern European poets, especially, which really thrilled me. In a, in a really kind of stripped down poetry, not a lot of verbal mm -hmm. techniques, which I re really pleased me. Uh, in fact, when I learned to read French and read the Surrealist, I was just so dismayed by how musical they were. I thought that they, as I read them in translation, they seemed so flat, like Niki no para, you know, that kind of flatness, which was just really appealing to me. Then I read them and they went, uh, that disabused me of them for a little while. Uh, but so, yeah, I took it backwards, and I'm certain that I wrote, wrote, you know, I stole from them all the time and wrote, tried to write like them. But also the poet Chirhan was a big influence for me, if you know that uh, philosopher. Say the name uh, again. Uh, Chirhan, I'm probably not pronouncing C-I-O-R-A-N, E-M, Chirhan. He's an aphorist for the most part. Um, Hungarian, then moved and began to write in French. Uh, but to my money, and Roland Barthes is a poet as much as anything else. So those guys, those two had a big influence on me as well. And finally, got to the English, the, the Americans, and uh, in the in Plum, we, uh, Mahila uh, is our translator, and so she's been great in reaching out. She's got this vast network. She and Michael Warr have this vast network, so that's been a big help. Uh, so I think we were committed to out of 12 poems, we try to run two or three in translation, two or three contributors in translation, <coughs> and seven uh, in English. Yeah, in the anthology is kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Belen, is, Belen is also one of, one of my favorite huh? uh, poets. Uh, and I see the parallels between uh, Polish poetry and what Philan is doing. It's that shift from the macro to the micro world, back and forth between yeah. macro and micro. Yeah. Do people read him, do you think, Sandra? Excuse me? Do you think people still read him? Yes. My Good. students, my students do. <laughs> Your students I know do. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope that's true. <laughs> more universally I, I have my doubts but yeah i'm glad that your your students read them but 
I'm not so sure. One of the things that, um, you know, we always find blind spots. And um, one of the things that I hope to cultivate going forward, uh, I'm happy to, to know certain people who are, whose range is wider than mine. And, and uh, one of those, someone I taught with at Pacific University for 15 years is uh, Kwame Dawes. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. Kwame always reminded us of our blind spot when it came to African poetry. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm happiest about is that Kwame and Chris Abani Mm -hmm. are doing this folio series for 10 years of African poets and bringing mm -hmm. that in. I mean, I know Bly brought a whole, I mean, I know whatever you think of weeping poetry and, mm -hmm. and Bly's translations, but he brought, brought a whole world uh, to us at a particular time. I mean, maybe not oh. to all of you, but I was young at, at that oh. time and, and de mm -hmm. deeply influenced. Yes, um, before and, Bly kind of went off the rails with the Iron John. Right. He, was a, right. he was a major figure for me. Uh, when I read Silence in the Snowy Fields, I was mm -hmm. just, yeah. And then the translations. Well, his, trans right, his translations yeah. were, were. Yeah, yeah. And he knew everyone. Right. Before, And he was sort of uh, Sontag-y in, in that sense that she introduced him to an American audience, the Europeans that they should have known. Yeah. But he was, yeah, a major figure with the weeping poetry. Well, and also uh, somewhat, not, not like Pound at all, but somewhat like Pound in one way, he would yeah. convince people like Coleman Barks to do um, mm -hmm. the Rumi translations yeah. and, and so forth, and pull people in to, to translate work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Ilya Kaminsky was like this as well. He was on the plane constantly going off to festivals and mm. um, around the world and bringing back poets mm. from that. And um, I have been listening, I, I have, have done some of, the, you know, read some of the festivals and participated in the festivals. But of course, then the pandemic, well, I mean, once I took over the, the journal, then the pandemic hit. And, yeah. Um, I was up in my studio in Montana and not moving. <laughs> so Ooh. no one, <laughs> right? No human, <laughs> right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, the next question I just want to put out there: um, since you all uh, do publish international poets, and given the state of the world right now, what's happening in Ukraine? Um, and because I've been enjoying very much uh, what you sent, Sandra, about you know the, the the links to the Ukrainian poems and the forum where they're discussing um, their work, I I'm curious if you feel um, what you think about we as writers writing a political poem. I know that in the forum um, they talk about whether or not there's about that line between writing a political poem and having it turn to propaganda. Mm -hmm. And um, and there are some poets who say, anytime you make a stand to not write propaganda, you are writing propaganda, <laughs> um, which I kind of understand how that works. Um, but, but I am curious because then, you know, also I think it's, is it Kevin Young who said, anytime you write a poem, that alone is an act of politics, it is a political act. And I do believe that as well. So if you could talk a little bit, um, maybe as poets, but also as editors on your thoughts of the role of um, the political poem um, for, you know, for these days, but maybe for all days. I just am curious about your thoughts about that. Um, would you like to start on that, uh, Philip? I'd almost like to think of it more as a public poem rather than a political poem. Mm -hmm. I think every poem, verbal texture and play, attention to the language is essential. And the, the, when you get into flat statement, mm -hmm. is when you sort of get into trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to follow a seam in the language mm -hmm. and see what the language wants to say. Also, I'm very interested in voices. Yeah. We live in, the internet is filled with voices. 
It's sort of like what Caliban said, this aisle is full of sounds. Mm. Yeah. And then I, I very much like the idea of tuning into voices, different mm -hmm. voices, and not speaking in my own voice, but speaking in these voices that I hear. Mm -hmm. That's one way of avoiding flat statement. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, and of course, the danger of the flat statement to become too pedantic or too, yeah, didactic. Um, Sandra, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would agree with Kevin Young that all poetry is, by the choices we make, is, is political. Um, but um, if you, and I'll send um, both uh, Danny and, and so if, it's, if you're interested, I'll send you the little folio that we just put out mm -hmm. of voices from, the, from Ukraine. Which um, is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it closes with one voice that is actually Polish, and um, that's Piotr Florsha, who you've published, uh, Danny, um, mm -hmm. in Plume. And I asked him to write. Uh, Piotr was my was my student, um, and is now a very very close friend and someone I admire tremendously. And um, he was absolutely devastated by the death of Adam Zajewski and just wrote this, just this exhale to me at the, at the, at the time of, of Adam's death. And I asked him to write a tribute. And I, I think it's quite a beautiful tribute. And the one thing that he brings out is um, before Adam, actually, Milos made that turn from the political poem to the poem of, of the physical world. Mm -hmm. of, and um, Adam did this as well. And it, it cast him out as, um, as a Polish poet for a, a, a period of time. And he wrote a, a, a manifesto saying, you know, we must, we must write about the underrepresented world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Danny, any thoughts that you'd like to? Oh, just that, um... I was thinking about the poems that we received over the last two years about the pandemic. And it was sometimes wonderful, sometimes disheartening that they addressed it uh, as if the subject itself were sufficient for to generate gravitas and uh, insight. And I got a lot of kind of not very good poetry, um, that it was too direct. And in a sense, I felt that uh, it, it lacked that sort of looking at things a slant to speak of Dickinson for a moment. Um, that they, it was sort of like watching a, you know, when you watch a film from 19 or a mediocre film from the 80s, it's, it's immediately identifiable by the fashion and the technology being used. And I think that there's the ephemeral quality to a number of those poems. They aren't going to last because they address too specifically. Uh, that moment. Um, so I think there has to be a fusion of both urgency and uh, timelessness. And uh, it's a hard thing to do, but when it works, it's, uh, it's a really powerful tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm thinking again of that, of that forum, um, of the poems from Ukraine. And, and what I will say, and the reason I wanted to ask the question about the role of, of politics or, or the public poem, which I which I do think the, the distinction is important um, mm -hmm. to Philip, but 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 in that forum, I I was one of the questions that was asked to, you know, this a long list of terrific poets from Ukraine. Um, they were asked, well, do you feel, how do you feel differently about yourself as a poet now, now that the war is, and I should preface, this is actually from 2014, so it's not um, that was recent, and but. but you know, they were kind of saying, what do you feel is the role of poetry right now in the midst of all of this? This was right after everything happened in Crimea. Um, and so many of the poets said they didn't even really 
number one, they didn't have time to write as many poems. They really weren't focusing on writing poems. They were so engulfed in the, in the war. And, um, um, and yet, you know, they, and they kind of made it seem as if that, that seemed to be something they had to put aside for a while. And maybe even it just didn't feel as important compared to everything happening right there around them. And I, on the one hand, I understand that, but I would also say that having read their poems, um, for me, um, as an, an outsider trying to understand some of that, it was crucial. You know, it's it's so um, it, it made me feel like they're underestimating the power really of continuing that work um, because I don't know how else we can can um, even begin to to feel what we need to feel about all of that. I um, I don't know. I think it's an important important question. Um, I understand why they have to turn their attention to other things, but I. I felt as if too often it was, um, they were underestimating the power of their own words, reading about it from people dealing with it, you know, in, in that time. So um, it feels it feels important, but, but yes, doing it in such a way that it's not didactic and, and not, um, that is told slant. I like that, Danny, um, that you mentioned it um, that way. Yeah, so. Um, uh, one last question that I wanted to put out there, and then I think we probably, unfortunately, will be out of town, time. Um, I did hear, especially um, in Philip and also Sandra's works, I did hear, I think, a use of some form. And um, Philip, you were talking about that and which, you know, um, having gleaned some of that from the different poets that you have published over the years. I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about your thoughts um, about how your poems may have um, changed a little bit with respect to using form, having published um, poets, so, so many, but such a wider range of poets. Danny, your your forms are, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe not following a strict um, particular form often, um, but still you manage to get in um, the sort of elegant rhyme internal often, and certainly a lot of sound work into your poems. But would you mind each talking just a little bit about that, um, about the use of forms traditional or otherwise, um, nonce forms too, that may have come about as a result of your work as editors, so. Sandra? <laughs> <laughs> my, my change in, 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 in form, it sounds positively Ovidian, but anyway, the, um, didn't come about because of, of any editing. That, that I was doing, though it does certainly have an influence on the editing I'm doing now. Mm. But um, I first started as a, as a free verse poet, studying with, with uh, Richard Hugo, but very much under the influence. People always say that I uh, attribute my work to be influenced by Elizabeth Bishop. And I have to say, no, no, it was, it's actually Robert Wool. Um, oh. But, and, and Yates, and um, then Hugo's teacher, who is a very strong influence on poets in, in the Northwest, and that's uh, Theodore Refke. Um, so yeah. even though I was writing free verse, I was very aware of, of using offline and, and so forth. But I, I didn't go to it for any editorial reason. I, I went to form that I, I I thought this next book was going to be all science. Um, I I, um, I went to the sonnet to put a governor on myself, and once I got into the sonnet, then I discovered how delightful it was, and you know, the, having that that constraint of you know, fourteen lines in a turn, and and, mm -hmm. and um, I, first I I. I I followed the prosody and then you, you feel it's almost parental, you know, what can I get away with, with, with right. this? And then, um, though I do think that some people are getting away with too much and calling things songs, but it is, you know, different variations on, on the little song. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have, uh, I was first a, a fiction writer and um, uh, I have strong narrative tendencies that I, I try to break, but they keep coming back. And so I quickly went from the sonnet to the sonnet sequence. <laughs> and that's where, that's where I am now. And then um, 
of a, a lovely poet, Tammy Holland, was had come uh, across the state. She was a poet laureate after I was in Montana. And, and she left behind this book by Carl Dennis and I picked that up. And then I, I started, I broke out of the summit because I wanted to it would become more conversational in the way that, 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 that Dennis is. And um, so that's, but it has nothing to do with, I mean, we are publishing um, online. We're about to publish a crown of, of sonnets, um, but the person who, submitted it, gave it to me as a, half of his manuscript was redacted and then the other half was unredacted. This was he oh, wow. in the chapbook competition. And I had to tell him, we'd like to publish the crown of sonnets. But, <laughs> but, but, but the, and, and we've had a, a lot of discussions uh, among the, the interns because we teach this as a, as a class. Ah, okay. And um, uh, in certain forms, like erasure and redaction, um, you know, are, are forms that the students really like to pick up because it gives them a, uh, a sense of agency and, and playfulness and so forth. But we've had a lot of talks about how 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 we respond to them aesthetically when they come oh, across, okay. across the desk sure. um, at Poetry International. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. You know, and I should have prefaced my question that that I've, um, it, it felt sort of like a given that that I'm assuming that most of that you all do see yourselves primarily as free verse poets, um, as, as certainly I would for my, myself as well. And so I didn't mean to suggest that that I that any of you, you know, were seen as formalist poets in any way. But um, um, but I'm just curious about how form works its way into your poem. So thank you for that. Santa. <laughs> I believe that the, the 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 poet needs to be in all camps and no camp at once. You know, it's <laughs> it's wide open and we're learning Absolutely. every day. And Agreed. the conversation is why we the conversation and the and the problem solving is why we stay involved with this. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah, Philip. How about you? Well, I, I thought of myself as a free verse poet, but I've always vacationed in forms. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. <laughs> I'm Robert Frost. I've been acquainted with the night, which is such a tightly formed poem, and yet it sounds utterly conversational. Mm. Scratch my head. How the hell did he do that? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, Danny, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, just what has been said. Plume publishes. We are in all camps and no camps at once. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's my own work. Uh, I've never worked uh, only in the most elastic sense of something called mm -hmm. something like sonnet. I'm sorry yes. about that. Uh, I'm a transgressor in that, Sandra. But um, I, I think it more, I wish I could set limits from, I'm really so thrilled with the puzzle making aspect of poetry too. I mean, that's what I kind of enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. But I wish, um, I like the idea of having a project of, a, in some ways having a form is very uh, appealing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could do it straight, but I think the, the idea of these, for example, these definition poems, they serve in the same way, that kind of purpose of imposing mm -hmm. uh, a little form upon. Uh, yes. You know, and it's wonderful yeah. to have, you, you have five weeks or ahead of you going, oh, I can do this and this, and uh, you don't have to think so much about other things. And so for me, the notion of a project of a particular subject even uh, takes the place probably of a form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's so much more that we could talk about, and um, I, I wish that we had more more time to be able to do that. I think you're absolutely right, Danny. I, I meant to say those the definition poems are so interesting. They they, mm -hmm. all, they sort of overlap with list poems, I suppose, and and um, yeah. I, you know, they're really um, yeah they were wonderful. Um, but it has been such a pleasure to have all of you um, join us for the Dolly Poetry Series. Thank you, and um, the. Um, if you will, please let your, your friends all know that the program will be will remain up on our Dolly YouTube channel. So um, um, if someone cannot 
join us uh, for this premiere, they can always come back and, and listen to this conversation. And um, I wanted to say thank you again to the Dali Museum for hosting um, the program for us. And uh, thank you, Joy, and thank you, John Fisher. Thank you, as always, to our, our executive director, Hank Hine. And um, look forward to learning more about your works and, and reading more of your wonderful journals. So Sandra, Philip, and Danny, um, thank you. And come back again to see us at the Dali Museum. So thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.